um, right, so this, uh, this talk is, is scalability, but at what cost? Uh, this, I don't know if people keep track of these. This was a meme, you know, a few years ago. Um, it was originally, the work was sort of started by uh, Michael Izzard, Derek Murray, and myself. Um, you'll, you'll, you'll hear the story, but basically we had some free time to kill and uh, wanted to look at uh, a few things about distributed systems. We had built some, uh, and we had some opinions, and uh, we, we decided uh, we were in a position to write a fairly opinionated paper, a position we hadn't been in before, so we, uh, we did that. A lot of what I'm gonna tell you uh, are, uh, so let's say opinions are biased. Um, you might disagree with some of the conclusions. That's great, we can talk about it. Um, don't make any financial investments based on what you hear here, but just take, take what I tell you, put it in your brain, and decide if it's, uh, if it's gonna be helpful for you. So, let's see, this is the sort of thing that started everything off uh, from, our, from our point of view. This is some data from a, a paper in, in 2014. So it's a little, it's a little outdated now, uh, the results here. The systems involved have gotten better, but um, the, the issue, the core issue, is still uh, a problem. Um, this is a paper, uh, the GraphX paper, where uh, the GraphX authors were looking at large-scale graph processing. So what sorts of computations can we do on graphs? You know, relatively large graphs. These graphs have billions of edges in them um, across different, you know, different systems with many, many cores. Um, you know, hundred of cores, and in this case they're looking at graph connectivity, right? So, um, you know, which which nodes in your graph can reach other nodes in your graph, uh, following a, a traversal of a bunch of edges potentially. And uh, you know, you look at the numbers, and they're num you know, like uh, it sure seems that uh, things get better as you go down, right? GraphX um, really, you know, is pretty pretty solid compared to GraphLab, a purpose-built uh, graph processing system. Uh, but GraphX is sort of friendly and, and you know, lives in the Spark ecosystem, so that's nice. You, know, you get, uh, get some good, good trade-offs, and basically, you know, these numbers look pretty, uh, pretty pleasant. They fit with the, the narrative of uh, you know, systems work is moving forward. Now, um, graph connectivity. How many people do graph connectivity regularly? Yeah? Right. That's okay. Fair enough. So I'm going to give you a little uh, primer on the algorithm that is being used in these systems to do graph connectivity. Um, just, you know, don't, don't worry too much about the specific uh, details here, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna sketch what's going on. So one way to figure out in a graph who's connected to whom is, is the following. You start, you give every node in the graph a label, typically its own name. So if the, if the nodes are numbered zero up through number of nodes, label everyone initially with their own name, uh, zero, one, two. And then what we're gonna do is repeatedly uh, until this, this stabilizes, repeatedly look at every edge in the graph and look at the labels on the, the two ends of the graph. And if they're different, uh, we're gonna take the larger of the labels and overwrite it with the smaller of the labels. Right, so as, as we run this over and over again, essentially the small labels in the graph flow through the graph and, and in each component, the smallest label will eventually take over the entire component and it'll stick. Um, and we will have, assuming the labels were different when we started, will have all of the connected components identified by their label, right? Basically what's going on, I didn't want to walk you through the code, um, but you can sort of see, if you've been reading along, that, that, that does the same thing. So not only is this a nice uh, hunk of pseudocode describing label propagation, it's actual code, um, it's Rust code, and you can run it on my laptop. So we did. Um, these data sets all fit comfortably in, in main memory on my laptop, they're, you know, between six and 15 gigabytes, but, you know, but they fit. So we can add another line here if we wanted. Um, new system called laptop. It's got, uh, it's got one core uh, at its disposal. And, um, you know, you, you get numbers like this, which might be a bit potentially surprising. Um, uh, we thought they were surprising. Um, actually, sorry, we didn't think they were surprising, but um, we thought the audience would think they were surprising. Now, uh, so this raises some questions, and we'll get to those questions. Uh, but before we get to those questions, um, for all of you out there who, who didn't raise your hand when you were doing graph connectivity, let me uh, reveal that label propagation is not a good way to compute graph connectivity. Um, it fits really nicely in these scalable frameworks because there's a lot of parallel work to do. You, know, you pick up all these edges totally independently, and you look and you see who's connected to, uh, to whom locally. But it's a very bad algorithm. Um, there are better algorithms. This algorithm called Union Find that you learn in undergrad computer science. Uh, you know, it sort of dates back to the 70s or 80s. Um, and if you implement that, it's, it's one additional line of code and it knocks off an order of magnitude from your running times. So 
you know, we've taken what's essentially you know, undergraduate level computer science, uh, written 10 to 15 lines of code, and we're now running, you know, 10 to 20x faster than these distributed systems are running on 100 times the resources. Which uh, is a bit, you know, there's some existential angst that shows up at this point if, if you're a sort of person who builds and uses these distributed systems. You've got to, like, sort out um, well, fundamentally, like, you know, what went wrong? Um, how did we get to this state where our systems are not actually faster on these problems than a naive, you know, sort of one-off computation on, on your laptop? And roughly, uh, our take, our analysis was that the systems community and people using these systems that sort of fetishized scalability. Scalability is really exciting. Like if I have scalability, then eventually I'll become Google, right? Because they have, they have scalability. Um, and we were, just, we were talking earlier about causality, and it doesn't work this way. Um, but mistaking scalability, which is a, fundamentally a means, it's a, a tool for doing something, um, for performance, which is what you actually want to get. You want to be able to do things with your system that you couldn't previously do, maybe on your laptop. And you're hoping scalability would get you there. And the question is, does scalability actually get you to what you would have been able to do with your, you know, your workstation or, or your laptop? So uh, we came up with a way of thinking about this, not an earth-shaking, uh, earth-shakingly new way of thinking about this, but this picture will hopefully clear things up here. Um, these are two actual scaling curves for two systems, GraphLab and uh, NIAID. NIAID's a system that I, uh, I was involved in uh, when I was at Microsoft Research. And this, this particular problem is doing iterations of PageRank uh, on the Twitter graph. So as you add more cores, both systems get better. If you're interested in scalability, you might say that, well, you know, NIAID seems like it sort of chokes a little earlier, right? Uh, who knows what's going to happen at 512? It might actually be worse than graph. Who knows, right? Which is exciting to think about if what you're excited about is scalability. Um, but I'm going to put another measurement on here, which hopefully will clarify some things, which is the single uh, laptop implementation, how long does it take to do iterations of PageRank? And it draws, uh, quite literally, a distinction between these two curves where uh, the lower line is, is actually imp improving on your laptop. It takes a little while. It takes 16 cores before we're actually improving on a tuned single machine implementation. Uh, but that's fundamentally different from the other line where, at least in these data, GraphLab has since improved. Uh, and been acquired by Apple for $200 million, so you know, we can afford to make some jokes. Um, you know, if they don't actually reach this line, is that interesting? I mean, what's, what's uh, well, fundamentally, we thought the thing that was interesting was looking at uh, or identifying for each of these systems the configuration that outperforms a single thread. Where is the, the point in their scaling curves where they actually hit this laptop line? And we would call this the cost. So for NIAID, there'd be a cost of 16 cores, and for GraphLab, in this case, f about 512, basically. They have some data not in their scaling measurements that show that they can beat this, this line. And again, since, uh, since their paper was published, they've improved, done more engineering. But the, main, the gist of this is that you should ask this about systems, that scaling measurements up above the laptop line, they're pretty, pretty uninteresting, right? I mean, I could build a distributed system that is my laptop, plus as many cores as you want to give me, and I'll, those cores will play video games, they'll mine Bitcoin, don't care. Right, so I can, I can make that curve up above the laptop look. However, I can make it look like a sine wave if you want, because um, it's all extra fluff that I'm just uh, parallelizing. The laptop is the only work you actually needed to do. Uh, so uh, you know, we're trying to sort of focus attention, I guess, on the region below the laptop. How does your system look once it's actually better than what you had before? Um, so this results in some, some slightly awkward um, curves. So some systems out there uh, it's a log scale, by the way, on the y-axis. Um, they just they don't meet the uh, the single-threaded benchmark, and um, th this may be fine, right? You may have to come up with a different reason why you'd want to use this system, and there are other good reasons. Uh, you know, your laptop can't. I'm not actually advocating that people should use a laptop. Definitely not my laptop um, for your computation, but it's worth thinking about. You know, like why why are we are we using this because we're going to go fast? Uh, what's the deal? There have been some responses to this. Um, that's good. I mean, we were mostly trying to start trouble. Um, you know, we were trying to get people talking about what's going on with these systems. Uh, and there, as I said, there are plenty of good reasons that you might be interested in, um, in doing these things. So one, one very common class of response, I'm going to work through a few of them, but one of the common ones was, uh, amateur, you know, 
a billion edges isn't big data. Uh, you need, you know, if you can run it on your laptop, we're fundamentally not interested in that. Uh, you know, it's a fair complaint on, on the surface of it. Um, I just throw up some data. Uh, someone asked that, and then like within a week, I, I pulled down the common crawl data, which has about 128 billion edges in it. So it's about a terabyte uh, on disk. And laptop happily processes that uh, just fine uh, as well. Um, it's, you know, it's getting close, so uh, I don't want to be too smug here. Um, and these measurements, as far as I'm aware, don't exist for graphics, don't exist for Spark, in that these systems basically run out of memory at the limit of those graphs we saw uh, previous slides, the Twitter and the UK graph. Like they're JVM based, they use a lot of memory, and if you use more memory than you've got on your computer or you configure your JVM with, things just shut down. Right? Um, well, okay, I mean, they, they shut down, but, but these systems are fault tolerant, so they'll start up again. Uh, then they'll shut down. And, uh, then, uh, um, which, okay, so, you know, point number two, maybe your laptop doesn't have fault tolerance. That's absolutely true, and, and that w could not have been clearer than last night when we had no power or uh, uh, internet access. Um, so, you know, for that, for that mind, you know, your laptop isn't going to give you multi-site uh, resilience or anything like that. On the other hand, you do have to worry uh, about, you know, whether this is the tail wagging the dog or not, right? People build systems with hundreds of machines in them. If the only reason they're using so many machines is to recover the performance that they lost in making things fault tolerant, um, it feels like you might be on the wrong end of a vicious cycle, right? Uh, if the system would finish in one tenth of the time using one one hundredth the resources, uh, maybe you don't need the fault tolerance, right? In, in a big data batch computation setting, fault tolerance is fundamentally a performance optimization, right? You can always restart the computation. Um, and fault tolerance just tries to get you to the answer faster. Is it actually doing that or not is a, a excellent question to make sure that you know the answer to. You know, enterprise integration is important, and, and this is absolutely 100% correct, right? Like, my laptop is not, uh, you know, compliant with various, uh, you know, official, um, you know, it's not... Uh, uh, GDPR uh, compliant or anything like that. Um, I don't have HDFS adapters uh, in my file system. These things are important to do, and, and you should absolutely be happy to use systems that have them, but this really has nothing to do with scalability, right? You could turn on uh, Hadoop or Spark and just do a single slot uh, worker that pulls in all the data, does all the work uh, in that one thread, and then exits in the time that I just showed you. Um, you don't necessarily need to use a big data system for that. You just need to use these systems as task launchers, which, you know, is, it's a good thing, you know, if, if you don't want to have to do that stuff yourself, paying someone else to do it, very, very good, um, but don't, uh, don't get yourself tied up in knots necessarily trying to use the graph branded uh, subsystem. There are a lot of comments of this form. Um, author probably isn't very smart. Uh, you know, author probably doesn't know how to use Spark, which I think was, these were probably typed by various people who uh, did understand Spark pretty well, or at least paid a few thousand dollars to, uh, to be told that. Um, fair enough. I mean, we took the numbers from Reynolds and from Joey, the, the actual authors of these systems. Um, so, uh, and also, I'm the guy with the curve below the line, so I mean, draw your own conclusions. Um, the dual to this, the, thing, the answer that I liked the most, we got a few of these. Uh, there are a lot of people who came back and said, basically, thank you. Like, I, uh, sorry, as, as the person typing, I saw the similar sorts of things, but if I go on the internet and say Spark doesn't work well for me, the only thing that happens is I don't get a job, right? Like, if you show up and you, you buck conventional wisdom that these systems are magical fairy dust that makes things go fast, um, you know, it's like showing up and saying, uh, I don't know how to make C go fast. I can't write fast C programs. Um, people are like, well, okay, thank you for telling us that. Goodbye. So. It was sort of nice to have people who didn't really have anything in particular to lose show up and like, here's some data, um, you know, you folks figure it out. Uh, so we got a, a bit of support for that. Um, and I'm sure there's gonna be more responses. Uh, people will probably drag me over some coals afterwards. Uh, I'll, I'll add to the list and if it turns out that I'm fundamentally wrong, I'm happy to, happy to tell everyone. Um, but I thought we'd go through maybe a few more examples. Um, those, those results from 2014 are a bit stale by now, and the fundamental point back in 2014 wasn't that these systems are ick and are never gonna get any better, they're absolutely gonna get better. Um, the theme, though, of, of the work was more about, you know, how do we evaluate them to make sure that they get better? Like, how do we uh, track the progress 
that's going out these systems and make sure that we're constantly uh, either impressed or not yet impressed with the current state of affairs uh, so that we can complain or not complain, uh, and, you know, sort of move people in the right direction. So been tracking this uh, as time goes on. Here's some you know, more recent work from, from Sigmod in 2016 where people were looking at uh, data log. People are familiar with data log. It's SQL with, um, with recursive in some sense, uh, with uh, iteration built into it. And you can, do, you can do a bunch of things, but one thing that people often like to do is graph traversal type queries because uh, you don't know ahead of time how many joins you're going to need to do to actually fully explore uh, some relation or to derive all of the, the records you might derive. So some folks, uh, big data log is out of UCLA compared with systems from, you know, in order, uh, Berkeley, Stanford, University of Washington, doing data log style computations, graph reachability in this case. Uh, again, fortunately, using the same number of cores as before makes it easy. Uh, some similar data sets. There's some bigger data sets, too. Uh, they're off to the right of the screen. Um, but, uh, you know, again, you can, uh, you can turn on a laptop and try these things out, and you get, um, I, have, I have one and two cores here for, for a good reason, but you get times that are basically competitive. You, you didn't need necessarily all of the complicated uh, guff there. Now, I, I have one and two cores because in this case, uh, it is just my laptop, but it's actually using uh, a data parallel framework that I've, I'm playing with as like a, a thing that I like making. Uh, and, you know, it scales also, so, you know, one, one to two looks like you're getting a pretty good improvement, and it'll improve for a little while beyond that. Uh, we didn't actually measure it out on 128 cores. But the framework has a really cool property that I just want to throw out there as something that maybe you didn't realize you could do, um, which is that it automatically incrementally updates itself. So you went and did your reachability computation on some billions of edges, and someone comes along and changes an edge. How long does it take to correctly update the, the result and have uh, the new absolutely 100% correct answer ready to go? And in this particular system, um, tens of microseconds, which microseconds are not a, a unit that usually gets thrown around in the big data space, but uh, you know, pretty, pretty brisk. Uh, yeah, so this is the sort of thing that if we just, if we took the lines up above and said, looks good to me, I don't know that we would be moving towards these sorts of results. And so I'm, I'm basically this is why I keep showing up and putting these in people's faces. Like, you know, here's some cool things that you can do and I want you to want these things. Uh, not because you should, want my lab, again, stay away from my laptop. But, you know, if we're going to move the field forward, if we're going to get better infrastructure, we're going to need to ask for it. Uh, even more recently, so VLDB 2017 just happened uh, a month or so ago in Munich. And there were several, several papers there, but one of them was looking at um, clique computation. So, um, you're generally like motifs in graphs. So, you know, a clique, okay, is a fully connected in this case, graph on five nodes. There are other little motifs that you can imagine, um, you know, just small shapes basically on a graph. So you want to say in a larger graph, tell me about all the occurrences of this, this little pattern. Like I'm really excited to find bow ties or something like that in my graph or, or five cliques because I think that that maybe indicates a certain social structure um, that's semantically meaningful uh, for some reason. Yeah, what, uh, how does that work? And, and we, it's, it's an area that, that the database and graph mining people have been pursuing for a little while, threw up some results. And, and the, the seed paper, I don't want to harsh on them too much, but you know, they uh, showed up and like, okay, we're, we're improving on the state of the art, previous algorithms. And absolutely, these, this is totally an improvement. Um, but you, of course, you, know, this, you can write this thing down again in 10 lines on a single thread. And you got some numbers. And the first number, uh, you know, I was like, wow, that's, that's what I was expecting. You're a lot faster than this, you know, because that's, that's your story. Uh, the second number, though, is absolutely worse than, than uh, the scalable system. So, you know, I, I do want to point out, you know, like, there are good reasons to use lots of computers. They can actually help you do things, um, do things faster. We just need to have some standards and some expectations and stuff like that. Uh, unfortunately, I'm, I'm not the sort of person who just sort of lets things go. And um, so my laptop actually has two, two cores, two physical cores and two hyper-threaded cores. So you can, uh, you can turn them on. And this particular problem, uh, motif mining, parallelizes more or less trivially. Um, you just sort of slice up the uh, responsibility for the different outputs that you might produce, give everyone a copy of the graph and say, go and figure out those five cliques that, you know, start with a, a node with ID mod zero, zero mod four, one mod four, two mod four, three mod four. 
Uh, and the work just parallelizes beautifully across, across four cores. Sorry, beautifully, uh, parallelizes uh, very simply, uh, naively. And as it happens, it scales, scales pretty nicely. You could even go and do something. We did a sort of a hypothetical experiment of what if I slice this thing up 160 ways? Now, I don't have a laptop with 160 cores um, yet because the amount of money you have to pay Apple to get that is, uh, uh, yeah. So what you can do, though, is slice the, slice the graph up 160 ways, run serially through these things, and record the maximum amount of time any of the pieces took. So had you distributed the data and asked everyone, do your work, how long does it take to do the work on each of the 160ths uh, of the computation, and then maximize? And that number, I think, is an excellent baseline for like how much work should you actually have to do. So whether you can achieve this or not, don't know. But if you don't achieve these numbers, you should have an explanation why. Right? You should be able to tell people, hmm, yeah, well, we, we spent a while distributing the data, or uh, you know, we're, we're missing out on, on something else. This is a pretty good target, though, for a naive algorithm. Th these other systems up above were introducing fancy new algorithms. Uh, very naive algorithm, literally uh, ten, tens of lines of code. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm optimistic that uh, with data like this, as long as the right people put pressure back on the systems implementers, we can get uh, towards these, these smaller numbers where 42 milliseconds is like interactive time scales, right? Like if you're actually doing that, um, yeah, instead of waiting for a half a minute or something like that, you could actually get stuff back right away and, and actually interact with users in real time. It'd be really cool. Right, so this, uh, a lot of the content, I struggle a bit because a lot of this content's a bit of, bit of a downer, right? Like from an academic point of view, it's great. You've learned a lot about the state of the world. You've got some new reference standards and stuff, but from people who are like, huh, you know, that's, that's what I'm using. Um, man, I hate you. Um, I thought I'd, I'd try to have some, some slightly more optimistic comments, and this is not optimistic like I can magically make things go faster for you, but I'd at least reveal some progress that's been made uh, in the world. Not necessarily because of the cost work, but, but at the same time as the cost work, and one can understand perhaps how paying a bit more attention to how quickly things run um, yeah, could have helped, or you know, again, I don't want to take credit for it. So I'll just show you cool things that, that you can do now. So here's some data. This is, again, from the original cost paper. This is 20 iterations of page rank rather than graph connectivity. Um, the results are, are sort of similar to what we saw for graph connectivity in that the laptop is doing pretty well against these, these systems. Um, with the same attention to detail, sort of being aware of what your computer's actually doing, using a programming language that compiles down to, you know, to raw code instead of um, you know, bytecode or something like that, you can put together a system, and we've been working on this for a little while, a timely data flow, where you actually get uh, a lot of the, the solid performance uh, benefits. And these numbers, when you actually look at the, the traces of these, these numbers you're seeing because we're saturating the network uh, connections. You know, we're seeing these numbers because the CPU is pinned all of the time, and we can check and see its L3 cache misses, right? that sort of information. Um, you know, we're really running a program that's exercising the computer quite well to the point that we can look and see uh, what, what's actually happening computer-wise. Does it line up with our expectations? Which is great. This is like a great, I, I find, a great place uh, for me to be in where I can really do performance debugging in my program at the level of what is the, is the computer doing the thing I want it to do yet, as opposed to like what are the knobs on the JVM I should be setting, please, oh great, JVM deity. Um, hopefully some of you have had that experience, maybe not. But, um, I wouldn't want to wish that on you, sorry, not hopefully you've had the experience, but uh, I believe it um, has happened. Let me throw up another thing. Um, these, aren't, these aren't numbers, but it's, a, uh, it's meant to be sort of this aspirational goal for what sorts of things might you like to do. Um, Here's a stream of data, right? It's, uh, it goes from, so from left to right, and maybe they're like really cool social signals that come along the stream of data, like, like people tweeting about things and people tweeting about specific topics, and, and maybe they're tweeting at particular people. So there's a bunch of different interactions and cues about, about what's going on here. And there's some questions that you, know, you, you can imagine being posed, uh, like, okay, well, what's a, what's a really popular hashtag in this? The stream, and I'm guessing that a lot of you are like, yeah, look, I I can nail that. That's that's totally fine. I know how to count things. Um, word count's been around for a while, so you know we can try to make it a bit more interesting, right? What if you want to do this hashtag counting 
by the emergent uh, social structure in the graph, like who's communicating with whom, and these clusters that that, that structure defines, what's popular in each of them? So rather than asking you know, for, for males aged 18 to 49, you know, some pre-canned uh, statistic, you know, this morning people are talking about something uh, on Twitter. Um, apparently it's that, that there were good people on both sides of the Civil War. I don't know if you were following Twitter. So, um, so I'm guessing there may be two connected components there. Um, people have different opinions on that. And you might want to understand what's going on in each of them separately, independent of you know, the, the biological characteristics of the people. All right, maybe you could do this. I mean, this is, this is what the graph processing systems tell you you can do. What if you wanted to do this uh, in real time? All right, millisecond latencies. So the moment that a thing happens on what, Twitter or uh, you know, the, the platform that you're personally uh, attached to, you want to know, you want to see these, these ticks happen right away. You can do this today. Um, you could do this in 2013. Um, we've, you know, we've built systems that, that do these sorts of things. But, but you sort of, I'm gonna say this right, but you, you gotta want it, right? Like you, uh, if you keep going around just sort of downloading um, systems that have, oh, you know, mediocre performance and saying that's good enough for me, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna call it. You're not going to get to these really cool things, and that might be fine, right? I'm not, I'm not suggesting that any of you should feel uh, should feel bad about not doing this sort of thing, but it, but it's out there, right? You can, you know, with just a little bit of fighting and pushing, you can go and find these things and say, I demand this, right? Like I, I'm I'm tired of whatever silly nonsense you've been doing. I want something either like this or some other cool thing that you know that a computer can do, um, just doesn't do it yet. So I guess as a as a theme, um, systems are getting better. Right? Like when you look at certainly the academic literature, the systems are improving, their standards are improving, they're getting uh, faster, primarily in my experience, because uh, we demanded it. Right? Primarily because like the cost paper came out and people were like, oh geez, I won't be able to publish my next paper if it's not faster than a laptop, this specific laptop. Um, and that was good, that, that all of these, uh, well, you know, for one year the systems conferences didn't publish a lot of papers on graph processing, so that was my fault, I apologize for that. But subsequently, people absolutely had baselines that were, we've compared this now to a single thread implementation and it's, it's better. Yeah. So uh, for sure, multiple computers can do more than one computer, but you gotta, you gotta force people to, um, to actually make that happen. And that's, I guess that's where all of you come in, right? You have to actually like, look, I'm tired of your, your nonsense. I know that there's a 10X just sitting there, please um, you know, make that happen or I'll do it myself. So I thought I'd close this, I think this is just a fun quote, and thank you, um, I sort of put it up just as a little bit of sass, I guess. Um, but basically, you know, like a, a computer is a cool, super powerful sort of thing, and they can really do a lot, and it's sort of disappointing as an academic to see people use computers, hundreds of computers, to account for the fact that they don't know how to get that 100x out of the computer itself. And not that everyone should be able to do that, but you want someone involved uh, in building your stack who knows how to get uh, that sort of performance out of the computer itself so that you don't have to go and spend money, 100x uh, investment on, on your computers. 100x, like, okay, getting 100 machines on Amazon is, is fine, you know, you can do that. Um, the second 100x is really expensive, right? If, if you're planning on already using 100 machines and you're like, oh, sorry, we got another 100x on top of that. 10,000 machines, pretty expensive. Um, you know, that's, you, you really want to think a bit harder about how you can maybe tune the the actual system at that point. Um, all right, so I'm gonna wind down with that. Uh, just throw up some random things. This is me on Twitter. Uh, you're more than welcome to type sassy things uh, there at me. You might get sassy comments back. Um, you gotta be ready for that. Twitter is a pretty vicious place. Um, and all of this content is also um, up, up online. Just about everything I've been doing for the past few years has been totally open. You can go and you know, if you want to try this out on your own data, not because I recommend actually using this code to do page ranking or graph connectivity, but if you want to say like, well, what should I expect? You can go grab the code, try it out. Um, there's a bunch of other stuff too, like a whole bunch of repos there. My favorite one um, is the blog at, at the end. Basically, you know, ongoing investigation of, of a bunch of interesting topics, sometimes stuff that I'm doing, but also quite a lot of critiques of systems building and uh, current systems research that's going on. 
Some of which will line up maybe with your interests, some of which may have nothing to do with uh, what you're interested in, but uh, hopefully at least is entertaining and, and, uh, and delightful. But I'll stop there. Uh, my understanding is that we have uh, some, some minutes for, for questions, for feedback, you know, get off the stage, that sort of thing. Um, but if you do have questions, I think the right thing to do is to waggle your hand around and we'll find a microphone for you. Yeah. There are some hands, but waggle them very aggressively so that, uh, good. So, um, I understand your concerns about scaling, uh, and uh, I used to do way back in the day when it was first uh, version 15, and it took forever to get anything run on it um, compared to what I could do on my laptop. But the thing that I gained from it was me and all the other programmers I, I was working with now had a standard framework that we could code against. So there was some loss in processing efficiency, but there was a gain in, in developer efficiency. What is your response to that? That, that seems like a great point, right? Um, there are a bunch of other incidentals that come with using common frameworks. Um, from an academic point of view, so uh, to be very clear, I'm an academic, I'm not a, uh, uh, a business-minded person, so um, my, my gut reaction as an academic is, that's absolutely wonderful and a great idea. What does distributed computing have to do with that? Right, like you could just as easily build a, a common framework that is a bunch of libraries that you link against using whatever code base you want, and uh, you know if you, if you you can write a graph processing API that that just uses a single single thread. Not that you should, but you know th that uses a single thread. You get the same benefits of great. We have a common infrastructure. Um, it happens that some people have done that for you already because they have a larger distributed framework that that they feel is exciting. But does that necessarily can, can we decouple those two things of good software engineering? on the one hand, and using lots and lots of computers um, to melt icebergs because polar bears are evil um, as a separate concern. Um, so th this is my reaction to it. Like, I, I'm, not, I'm not yet convinced um, that big piles of computers are fundamental for getting everyone on board uh, on, a, on a team. Y you could argue, and I think it's a sane argument, that what using 10 times the computers gets us is access to a larger pool of developers. Right, like the number of people who are writing uh, C, C++, Rust, you know, low-level type stuff versus the number of people who are comfortable with Python and Java and, and whatnot like that, they're very different. And um, bringing in people uh, from a Python background is a great thing to be able to do because these people have other skills, right? They have you know, data science skills. When, when you know, people were learning about screwing out the registers, they were learning about statistics. And maybe you have to eat the 10x or 100x to bring that skill set into the uh, into the team. And that is absolutely worth considering. Is that, is that worth it? Or you know, should we bring someone else in who can then work with them to try to claw back that, uh, that overhead? Um, I don't know. This is a bit of a rambly. I don't know that I nailed uh, that answer. Sorry. But, uh. So this is a bit of a stupid question. And uh -huh. then the follow-up is probably going to be a little less stupid. Oh. But when you said that you run something on Spark, for example, and it's 160 cores, uh, I'm assuming that means that the only thing running on that Spark cluster of 160 cores is your one thing, right? right. So, yeah, so to be clear, these numbers are, are pulled from the people who wrote these systems. Um, I'm, I'm sort of trusting them that when they did the measurements for their own system, they gave themselves favorable conditions. Um, yeah. They certainly didn't report otherwise, though I haven't double-checked with them to make sure that they weren't just screwing around. Um, uh, but yes, I believe that they had, uh, they spun up, uh, typically these are cloud instances, so they'll spin up, uh, you know, 16 machines with eight cores each on Amazon, do some work there. It's very possible there's cross traffic going on because uh, these, are, these are virtualized instances, but. Um, so, the, I, I mean, that's what I assumed. The follow-up question then is, um, so one of the reasons that I think scalability is important personally is that you have to, uh, it, there's not one thing going on in the system at once. And so your one laptop, while it will be great to run one small fraction of an aggregate that is important, what we really care about at the end of the day is you know, the daily reporting or what the customer sees, what data it sees. And that's not one thing, that's a hundred things. And they all have to run concurrently and they all have to be able to come back with a result, right? And so while, I mean, I guess the case that you could make would be then let's have 161 core instances and run that, uh, and I think there's a really good case for that, rather than having like these big bloated systems. 
Um, but uh, yeah, I, I guess that, that was just the question. Is, yeah. is, is that your recommendation, have, having a bunch of tiny, tiny one core systems that run? So I, I, want to, I mean, you're basically, you've, you've nailed my position, but I want to step back from saying that's my recommendation. I, I, I don't want to make a recommendation. I want to make sure that people at least consider that, yeah, if you have to do a large scale, fun uh, graph reporting uh, type thing. Uh, most of, by the way, most of what I said has been about graphs. Graphs are interesting and, and, and exciting to me. But those are slightly weird computations. But if you need to do something that could be better done, or as efficiently done, even, um, on a single machine, yeah, just spin up. I mean, you can get uh, Amazon instances that are not uh, you know, Spark or Hadoop or anything like that. You can just turn on a machine, have it run whatever code you want, um, and, and hooray. You know, and then you actually have 160 machines each doing their own thing, as opposed to 160 way 160 computations fighting with each other. Um, so it's, you know, it's worth understanding and considering. Um, are you getting the thing from scalability of the system that you wanted? <coughs> um, where a task spawner is, it's good to have that be scalable. It's, it's fundamentally a different sort of, you know, if you have 160 utterly independent computations, yeah, just do them separately, um, I, I would say. Hello? Yeah, it's me. Ah, uh, um, Frank, I, I think uh, what I got from the, the, your talk was that um, it's, not, it's not necessarily about Hey, everybody, use use your laptop. I think it's about like, you know, if you want performance, consider the nature of the problem you're trying to solve, and don't just throw machines at it. You know, but if you're going to throw machines, think about what you're doing. Um, can you kind of like go into more detail about like why it's so difficult to solve like uh, graph databases in a distributed you know fashion using like many machines? Like, just go over some of the challenges that. Sure, They're sure. So uh, graph computations to me, I mean, graphs, graphs are a thing, and, and maybe you have graphs in your life and maybe you don't, but they're one of the first types of computations where the fundamental operation takes a piece of data that has two names in it and says, I need data from both of these things. So I need some data that was not initially co-located. I need to track both of these things and then put them in the same place. If we were just doing something like, like word count or grep or something like that, or some sort of nice accumulative computation where you just zip through the, the data and are done, there isn't the issue of going and tracking down data, essentially using random access in different parts of the computation. And this is something that has um, frustrated a lot of the big data community where they, they started from MapReduce or so, let's say, um, and even up through Hadoop and Spark and stuff. They were still largely missing the concept from database of indices, right? Where indices are what let you get quickly a particular piece of data out there without dropping the entire terabyte on the floor and then picking it up again and rearranging it. Um, so architecturally, if, if you think about what you really wanted your computer to do, it would be doing something slightly different than uh, a sequence of relatively coarse-grained batch computations, right? You'd rather have something that was maintained a bit more persistent state and was a bit more interactive. And that requires, I guess, rethinking uh, a bit of the, the classes of computation. So for example, graph, graph streaming is another example where if you want millisecond timescale latencies, it's going to be pretty tricky to think of that as picking up your terabyte of data, re-indexing it in order to serve back the one question a person had. Um, so I think fundamentally there are a few different types of computations that didn't really match the requirements that people uh, initially imagine. You know, if you're Google, you're like, okay, we want to index the web. We're going to do that once a day. Um, that's good enough for us. And as people tried to move more and more of their computations uh, into these frameworks, they're pushing up basically against the limitations of the frameworks and throwing machines at it was the only solution that the frameworks have, right? There isn't, there isn't another pressure release valve uh, in the systems for like, what if you want to, I mean, you can get some duct tape and bailing wire out and, and you know, a few other Apache products to sort of stitch together a few indices and key value stores and stuff like that. But the frameworks themselves advertise, you should just get more computers. Um, and that works only so far uh, if the problem is fundamentally mismatched to, to the tool.